Welcome everyone to the Community Violence Response Task Force uh, meeting. I am Tracy Parsons. I'm the facilitator of our community coalition. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the Community Coalition, it is a group in our community comprised of city government, law enforcement, our school districts, our park districts, Parkland College, University of Illinois, local funders, United Way and the Champaign County Mental Health Board, interested community members, our faith community, Basically all of us make up our community coalition. We decided a couple of years ago, as we started really tackling and taking on our community violence issues, that um, we wanted to be prepared as a community to be able to respond to community needs when these incidents of shootings are taking place. And so I like to make the comparison, those of you that have been around coalition meetings long enough, uh, know that um, I like to make the comparison around uh, natural disasters, traumatic events. Uh, we're organized as a community to be able to respond in those scenarios. Community violence is something that we're not prepared as organized entities to address when it occurs in our community. Since 2015, we've been dealing with unprecedented levels of community violence. It's, we've had an ebb and flow, good years, bad years, more difficult years than the others. We're coming off of 2019, which was one of our more challenging years. We learned in 2019 that it's important when these uh, significant incidents take place in the community, that we must be prepared to respond. We're in the middle of COVID-19, obviously a place that none of us have ever been in before. And so again, as our community violence has reached, reached a level uh, that we must respond and talk about solutions on how we're going to address our community violence. So welcome again to our Community Violence Response Task Force meeting. We usually hold these in the evening at community-based spaces where we have more structured and organized uh, free-flowing conversation about the incidents that are taking place um, and um, what we're gonna do to respond to them. So we are doing a Zoom meeting today. It's the first time I've ever facilitated one. Um, we're in the middle of COVID with stay at home orders, stay in, shelter in place, uh, social distancing, all of these things are uh, issues that are impacting our ability to come together as a community. So again, thank you for joining uh, our Zoom meeting today. I would ask you to stay on mute so that we don't have background information interrupting our conversation and our panelists as they share the, uh, remarks for us. We are Facebooking live as well, uh, this Zoom meeting. Uh, we have two individuals, Mary Catherine Roberson and Jorge Soto are monitoring comments and thoughts and questions that you may have. The chat rooms are available through Zoom as well as Facebook for you to ask questions and share thoughts and comments. We may not get to your, all your questions in limited time that we have today, but we will be responding to them. We will be taking everything into an account um, and continuing to figure out how we bring solutions to the table to stop and address our gun violence issue. So I believe we are going on four weekends in a row. It may be five where we've had significant gun related activity taking place each weekend, as well as we've had incidents throughout the week. Last week was a very trying week as we had shooting incidents all weekend that continued throughout the week and through the weekend once again. Last year, we had a record number of shooting incidents in our community. Uh, we are ahead of that pace that as of today's date. 
Obviously, whenever you start losing life, it's unacceptable. When the youth are 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, is even more of a reason for our alarm, our concern, and our requirement to respond. Those of you, again, that have been around coalition enough knows that my thing is that we will not normalize gun violence in our community. So it really requires all of us to come to the table to figure out how we address and stop, support, interrupt, all of those things for the individuals that are involved in gun violence. So we have, we're up to 93 folks on our Zoom panel. I know that we have representation from the Sheriff's Office, the Boys to Men organization, the STEM Illinois Project, Girls to Women, CU Try, Trauma and Resiliency Initiative, our faith community, Champaign Schools, or uh, Champaign Police, city government, concerned citizens, first followers, more than girls club, and crime stoppers. And so we have great representation on the meeting and call today, so thank you. We have a group of panelists that are going to speak to us for a few moments, and then we're gonna have some conversation respond to your questions and comments uh, for our panelists and have our meeting today. So our panelists, and the first will be uh, Urbana Mayor, Diane Marlin. She'll be followed by Urbana Police with Joel Sanders, followed by Urbana Schools, Dr. Jennifer Ivory Tatum, and then first followers is represented by James Tiger Corbin today. So panelists, you have a few moments to share a few thoughts and ideas, and then we'll move forward uh, from there. And I know there's a number of other organizations that I didn't mention. No slight intended. Uh, much love and thank you for being on the call. Mayor Marlin, please. Today, um, as many of you know, I um, became involved and very, very concerned about the increasing amount of gun violence in the community when I was a council member and became involved with CU Fresh Start as well as the Community Coalition. And as Tracy noted, over the past couple of years, um, what's been especially troubling has been the increase in gun violence among our teenagers. And it's taking you know, on the same pattern of um, retaliation that we were seeing among um, older individuals and they you know the, the pattern is becoming the same and it's the question is how do you um, how do you break this cycle of retaliation how do you how do you inter find the points of intervention um, how do you support the people who are the victims but also how do you um, prevent further acts from occurring and um, everything that was happening before COVID-19 um, hit our country is still there and it's being exacerbated by the stress and anxiety and the lack of structure and lack of school and programs now available to our youth. And that includes our own um, programs through the city and through the coalition. So one of our challenges um, as we plan for the next six months to two years is how how do we continue or change what we're doing to be more effective in, in addressing this violence when we don't have many of the former support systems and programs in place, and even the ability to have one-on-one -on -one contact with folks, with kids. So that's, um, that's what I've been thinking a lot about lately. Okay, great. So. Banner Police. Hello, I'm, I'm Joel Sanders. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm the patrol lieutenant here with Urbana. I don't want to take a lot of time uh, just talking so that there's more time for questions and, and answers as we move forward. I do want to thank the Community Coalition for the opportunity and hosting this meeting. Uh, as everybody on this screen knows that we can't arrest our way out of this. We can't, it, this isn't just a law enforcement issue. This is going to take the community uh, problem solving and working together in order to find a, a way to 
get out of the, the as Tracy put earlier, the weekend after weekend after weekend issues that we're dealing with. So we're here to answer questions uh, and here primarily to listen to what the concerns are and how we can help affect and, and solve those concerns. Thank you, Bill. Dr. Ivory Tatum. You have to unmute yourself there. Thank you. Um, so yes, as you guys all know by now, uh, we are we have been out of school for several weeks. Um, we're going to continue to be out of school between now and the end of the school year. And, and right now that is our biggest challenge. Uh, we've worked very, very hard uh, this year. We know who some of the um, our youth are um, who are um, around guns and have access to guns. And so we, we've uh, made lots of personal connections with those students uh, while we were in school, um, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, connecting them with, uh, you know, it's all about the relationships, right? Many of you on the call know that. So uh, making sure that they have uh, contacts and personal people that they can go to. Um, our clinical professionals have done a fantastic job. We've connected with um, families. Um, I've talked with families. We had some earlier incidents in the school year um, that prompted us right away to wrap around some of these young men and the young ladies associated with these young men um, and, and really were, uh, I, I feel like making some progress, but now not being in school has pretty much um, limited our ability to, to do any of that. You know, we're not able to get uh, our, our, our kids in groups and talk to them. Um, we're doing our very best through the remote learning process to reach out to students um, via phone calls and emails. But again, um, you know, that, that is a challenge moving forward because we have some youth that have not engaged in that process. Um, we're talking to their parents. Um, teachers are doing their very best to uh, make connections as well as some of our uh, support staff to reach out. So I think our biggest challenge right now is how can we um, reestablish some of those connections that we had already established um, when we, we can't see, see them in person. Um, we can't really get together in groups, uh, you know, and some all of those constructive activities that we had going on during the day and after school are not an option for us right now. So um, th those would be our biggest challenges. We're trying to work with parents, um, you know, but again, it, it is, it's so, um, not personal when you're sending emails and making phone calls and um, not being able to go and sit in somebody's living room and have the the one-on-one -on -one face to face so um, we're going to continue to do our very best to um, engage our youth uh, and and tap into the relationships that they already had um, to encourage the 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 uh, young young the boys and young men that we know are uh, attached to uh, our youth that have uh, had these incidents happen in the last uh, week or two to just encourage them to disconnect as much as they can and um, really not uh, get into that peer pressure of uh, the what is happening right now and, and being a social the, the group mentality and try to break through some of that. But again, that is our ongoing challenge. Thank you. Uh, Tiger. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, thank you for having me on this panel. And uh, I'm representing First Followers. And as you know, First Followers, many of us have been formerly incarcerated from the street. So we do understand a lot of these problems and issues what's going on now. Uh, we work in, as far as our group go, we have Go Mad, which is Go Make a Difference which focuses on ages 18 to 24. And these young guys that's out here, uh, you know, we give them a sense of direction. We give them a, a cultural understanding of self and provide life skills. We take in consideration um, determinants, you know, that's, that's involved with these young guys. So that's, that's some of the things how we approach in the situation. We don't believe in blaming. We look at both the shooter and the one who got shot, both as victims. You know, both of the families are victims. And it's a loss to the community. So that 
we we really strive to create a better relationship by providing a safer place for these young guys. That's some of the things that we just working on there. Um, I'm not gonna take up too much time, but uh, I think we really, we, what we wanna do is really focus on social determinants and getting people such as myself and I say Maurice and uh, other guys, Joby, we were trying to get into the schools where we can talk to these young guys, we can reach them because we had the experience and they will listen to us, we need to push that more and stop, stop trying to use fear as a deterrent because obviously they're not afraid to go to jail and they're not afraid to die. So we need to, we need to reconnect these guys into giving them a purpose or showing them a purpose, you know, because jail and fear is just, fear factor is not working. So with that being said, I'm, that's all. Thank you, uh, panelists, for those those opening remarks. A number of you, all of you, said some really relevant points. And and Mayor, I do have a question for you that came in from the audience. Um, so in 2018, when we first really saw this increase in the youth activity and the click related activity, um, and the back and forth that it appears is driving a lot of this activity right now. We got together, law enforcement, schools, community, to really talk about, and I think as uh, Dr. Ivory Tatum shared, we know who these, these guys are. We know their families. And so we have to be intentional and get back to that place where uh, we are talking about these guys as individuals, as their families, and trying to reach them in a very intentional way. And so we did that in 2018. I think we had a level of success in saving some of these boys from, you know, trouble. And as James just said, they're not afraid to, to die. And so when you don't have hope, you will respond and react and shoot at three in the afternoon and retaliate when you uh, just gotten out of the hospital from being shot. You know, all those things occur when you don't have hope and aspiration. So as a community, I want us talking about proactive, reaching these individuals and investing in them. That's what it's gonna take and that's what we're gonna have to do. So the question, Mayor, was wanting you to just elaborate about your thoughts on uh, where we had some success or what you'd like to see us continue or uh, uh, the, the programming and the services that, that, that you were referencing. I assume oh. you mean Mayor Marlin. I did. Okay. Um, thanks for asking that question. I think one of the most... Um, effective things that we've done as a community and as a city is um, we, you know, we have the position of our community outreach coordinator and Preston James until last week served as our community outreach person. He was a former police officer um, who, who um, then transitioned into this position. And I think he was very successful in getting the self-made Kings group um, it started in Urbana and he worked very closely with the Champaign schools, I know, and um, with the Urbana High School and Middle School. And um, we will be, we're updating his um, job description, that job description right now, and we'll be, you know, initiating a search for replacement for him because I, I strongly believe that having someone in that position is, is very important. And he had, um, he had, you know, significant success in reaching the kids. I think he had established a pretty good relationship. He, you know, I got to meet them, meet all the kids, uh, young men, I should say, involved in the program. And, and that I think is a very, um, is a very important piece of the puzzle. And, and as you said, it's all about the relationships. So we will, that I think is a, is a success story. Um, I'd also, it's another aspect of this, but 
you know, at the coalition for years and years, I've been attending meetings and we never talk about guns. And <laughs> how are the guns, you know, how do they get hold of the guns? Um, it, it, it's almost impossible. It, it, it's unbelievably easy for kids to get, get a hold of guns. And, and I don't know how we can be successful without starting to talk about that too. So. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I do agree with you that um, the model that we have as it relates to the goal getters as well as the self-made kings was a very intentional approach mm -hmm. to young men that we knew uh, that were on school radar, struggling, struggling at home, in the community, and on law, law enforcement radar. And so I, I really believe it's imperative that we uh, figure out how we mobilize, how we connect to talk about these young men and these, and these young kids uh, and plan our intentional approach. And so we're on stay at home orders, uh, social distancing is the environment, but we're gonna come out of that. And we wanna come out of that prepared and ready to address these young folks um, immediately. And so it really does require our attention. So I, I, I omitted in thanking the city of Urbana and hosting the me meeting today. Uh, we do rotate these meetings between Champaign and Urbana. And uh, when we started talking about this event, um, it was the Urbana shooting incident that started the conversation. So that's why we're in Urbana and Urbana's the host. Uh, Mayor Finan was able to join us today, so she is also here uh, as part of uh, the team that's uh, here today. Um, so, I got a question around, um, and Tiger, I'll address this to you. Um, you kind of opened up the idea of those individuals with, that have the lived experience that many of these young guys are going through. Um, how do we increase getting you guys connected and in front of and working with these young guys, uh, those of you that have been where they are? Talk to us about that, please. Well, I would say start by, we could start by getting, a, you know, getting us in the schools. Um, Maurice, Joby, myself, we was trying to get in the schools, but we can't do a wraparound and talk to these guys you know, and talk to them about where they want to go, where they future. You need to have somebody who's been down that road, who understands what they feeling and what they're going through. I understand it because um, me, myself, uh, I, I never thought, like when I was younger, I, ne I never planned on making it to C24, never. So to be 50 something now, I just didn't plan to be here, you know? So when, when you got somebody who, who's not planning or don't see a future, there's nothing that can really hurt them, you know? Um, and, they don't, and they don't see they self as, or, or they not making decisions on a long-term basis. Someone that, has a, someone that has the idea of, well, you know, I'm gonna be a doctor, a lawyer, he or she won't make them type of decisions. He, he, they'll think twice and they'll be like, I'm not gonna do this. But somebody who's just self-serving and uh, living in the now moment, and like you saying, we gotta really start identifying these guys. We gotta get them with mentors, such as myself. Uh, you got other guys out there that, that got past history who want to do good. A lot of these guys come back to the community, they're ready to do good, but the community block them. The community, is, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of things that's out there that don't allow them to get involved. We got an a excellent mentor, Tamika, who, who is begging to get into these schools. I mean, who would be, she would, she would actually be that mother figure that would probably you know, they, they need that somebody who know how to talk their language and she can speak their language, but she has a hard time. You know, you gotta get permission. So, but they, we can't put, we can't put these uh, barriers around there. And, 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 you know, if that's an issue that you're worried about putting, say formerly incarcerated people around the people, there are checkpoints that we could put there. 
you know, where there are checks and balances that we could put there. And we're willing to work with law enforcement uh, where they can, you know, uh, where, you know, where it can be watched. There's nothing, everything should be out in the open. But, so a couple of th so a couple of things. Thanks, Tiger. Uh, great response. So school is out at the earliest. And, and, and Jennifer, please jump in. I don't know if we're going to have summer school or summer related activities through the schools, but I think we need to be thinking about community based solutions and options. Fighting that battle right now of getting uh, background checks passed and those things through the school. Uh, you know that's long. That's more long term to try to figure out how we address that. I think it's really how do we look at community-based solutions um, and, and address it from that perspective, since, since we know we won't be back in school until maybe summer or not until August. So um, one question, Jennifer, while you talk about that, if you could also just you know, we, we always get challenged by the ability to talk about these kids individually and specifically with confidentiality and all of those types of things. So I, if you could talk a little bit about, as the school, as an identifier of these youth, what opportunities or is that too much of a challenge? But so maybe there's a couple of different things in there to unpack, but um, I'll let you respond to, um, accessing students uh, through the schools? So right now, as you mentioned, the summer is an unknown. We've had a lot of unknowns. Uh, you know, we just kind of are, are, are working week to week these days. So uh, we're, we're, we have our summer pretty much planned out. At this point in the year, we always would have uh, our activities planned out, but those are all on hold. Um, we're not quite sure if we'll have summer school, um, you know, with the, uh, limitations on social gatherings and any kind of gathering. Um, so, you know, we'll just, again, have to defer to our governor and around what might happen. Um, so I, I guess I really can't speak to what, how we might be able to access the students in the summer, because right now that's still an unknown for us. Um, in terms of accessing students, you know, as you mentioned, the background check part is the, the tricky part for us, right? And there are all those legal school code issues around um, that background check piece that we just, uh, you know, just politically just cannot um, break through. However, you know, I think, you know, Mayor Marlin mentioned uh, Preston James's former position, the community outreach piece, um, that that is a space where, um, you know, we can connect youth without them having to be, it, in a school structured or school formal environment and you know coming into the school during the day um, to establish that mentor relationship i think some of that was already happening i know um, preston was um you know having the young man talk to a lot of different people and 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 trying to have people in their ear about their previous experiences and you know and the paths and the choices that they were making um, so I think that is an avenue once that position is rehired um, and, and, you know, we have SROs now who um, hopefully, um, I know our new SRO hasn't um, been on the job very long, but he was starting to make those connections with some of the youth at our high school as well. Um, so we, we know that's tricky too, right, for our African American youth, uh, you know, that connection with the police, but that was something that we, um, are committed to and, and very intentionally we're, we're trying to establish that connection. So um, I think there's still a space to, you know, have James and first followers and people like that still be involved with the youth where it doesn't have to be through that formal, I'm in the school every day um, process, if that makes sense. So um, it, I, I'm, give me some clarity, Tracy, on what you were trying to ask about the confidentiality of talking about the young men. Say that again. Well, you know, I've been in t far too many meetings when we start thinking about planning and organizing, and then we can't talk about the kids by name yeah. so that we talk about who's his or her family, right, and who has relationships and connections to them. So we can't talk about these as individuals. And so I'm thinking about solutions that helps us not have that be a, a barrier, mm -hmm. right? So how can we talk about John Doe 
who we know has been struggling. He's on law enforcement radar. He's struggling at school. Mom is saying, I need help with him. Like, how can we talk about him in those terms so that we, whether it's first followers, whether it's boys to men, whether it's the Boys and Girls Club, we're able to look at individually what's, what the work Reverend Comer's doing. Sure. Uh, we can talk about them individually and what might be the best solution. So that's, so I, go ahead, yeah. So I think, um, you know, I've been around for a long time, just like you, and, and I'm a very much of a, a, that wraparound mentality, right? So I've, I've sat in several meetings this year uh, where we we have a parent involved. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the first thing is having that parent involved, having the parent agree that as a, as a uh, group, we're gonna talk about this situation and be honest about where we are with it. Um, and if the parent gives the okay, you know, to release and have, you know, me at the table, and you at the table and an advocate at the table and, you know, a mentor from first followers at the table and, you know, have all these people in those spaces where we can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations about, you know, what are we going to do and, and how are we going to break some of the cycle? I think that is, that's how we can do it individually. I think we, you know, we know who um, are, who's involved at our high school and, and even at our middle school now, you know, it's younger and younger, right? So um, we know who the cousins are and, you know, the, the uncles and the friends and, you know, so we, we know who those, uh, who those connections are. And when we want to break those cycles, we have to do it through the family and we have to be able to, you know, the, the parent agree that all these people can be at the table and we can, we can talk about this um, and, and hit it head on um, because you're right. We, we do have that confidentiality where we can't um, talk about, you know, should they're still children, even though they're acting like adults, they're still kids. Uh, so we need the permission to be able to do that. Um, but once we have that, and, and again, there's the relationship. So if we have the relationship with the family, with the parent, guardian, grandma, whoever it is, who's uh, said, yes, this is an issue. And I, I want the school to help me. I want the community to help me. I want my church to help me. I want my next door neighbor to help me. Whoever needs to be at the table to have that conversation, you know, we'll do whatever we can to facilitate that happening. Great. So. I'd like to definitely get that on your radar to help identify who these students students are. Uh, what do we need to do to get releases from families uh, so that we can talk about these 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 individuals directly and to the point. Um, there's been a number of comments and please, like I said, we might not be able to answer all the questions in the comments, but we are capturing them. So please share them. There's a number of uh, comments around social media and its role that's playing with young folks today and that ability to create who they are uh, through social media. And it is a driver. Um, and what kids today are putting on social media directly, uh, Mary Catherine has been monitoring it for us the last couple of weeks and there, they're, they're having their arguments directly on social media. They're talking about getting together and getting at each other and all those kind of things right there for us. And so I know we've got to have more social media champions following and sharing and communicating to us about what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what students are talking about doing to each other so we can work on this interruption part of this work and helping them deal with those We've got a number of unbelievable uh, trained professionals that know about interruption and know about how to deal with the trauma that many of these kids are having, that they're expressing through gun violence. And so uh, we've got to have and understand stronger connection to social media and, and what role that plays. Um, so there was a question um, as it relates to the guns. And so Joel, I don't know if law enforcement has a handle on where guns are coming from and how easy and accessible they are. I do know in most of the group settings I've been in with young people, they all say they know how to get a gun if they need a gun. And it is relatively, readily 
uh, available to them. So I don't know if law enforcement has any insight on that and thoughts on that. Yeah, guns are, are just trying to trying to curtail where the guns are coming from isn't a single response, isn't a single thing. Um, and I agree, kids, anybody can that, that uh, wants one can probably go out and get one, keeping in mind they're getting that, that weapon illegally. They're not going to Rule King, they're not going to Dick's, they're not going to uh, other uh, places that have are selling legal weapons, they're buying weapons that have already been stolen. Uh, and trying to find stolen weapons is, is a difficult task by ourselves. And this is one of the places that us partnering with the police, partnering with the community is extremely important. Because as much as the youth know where to go get weapons, others in the community know where we can go get weapons. I got a phone call. Uh, recently from somebody who um, wanted that to remain anonymous but was was wanting to tell me a bunch a lot of information about another community and where weapons were in that community uh, but the individual was very hesitant to then contact that local police department and give them information specifically so the police could react to it um, having information having actionable information is two different things and so working and partnering with the community to, to get actionable information and, and building a case uh, and chasing those weapons is very important. And, and the only way we do that is through a relationship. You have to trust the police. The police have to know what can trust you. And we've got to continue this kind of stuff. Um, and not just at my level, but my officer's level and getting my officers in, into more community meetings and getting my officer more into the community so that uh, the community knows the officers and the officers know the community. Do we have identified um, task force or officers whose focus is this gun issue and how to look at them? Or, uh, it, are there intentional officers where that's part of the main part of what they're doing? So the, the street, uh, street crimes task force, I can't speak today, um, working out of the CPD, that was part of their their mission was, was and in fact they started as a gun task force uh, unfortunately in the COVID days um, that that whole unit is on hold for right now uh, we've incorporated a, a, one of our members back onto the street here so uh, they exist um, and as with the guns come the drugs with the drugs come the guns and they're focused on that uh, but in today's environment, in the last several weeks, it's been more difficult to keep them out there and keep them uh, focused on this. Okay. Um, trying to address the questions as they're coming in. So there's a question around a gun buyback program. I think it was 2015 or maybe 2016 when we did uh, do a gun, buy, gun buyback program. Uh, we held it at Stone Creek Church in Urbana. Uh, we did, I don't remember the numbers of guns that we got off the streets that day. Um, they were not uh, returned or brought back by the folks we wanted the guns from, uh, but we did get, get a, a significant number of guns off the streets through that, maybe not from the folks we wanted them from, but uh, it may be time to revisit that. I think everything should be on the table at this point and so we've made note about gun buyback programs and uh it's been a number of years since we've done one so maybe it makes sense to to, to revisit it okay can so I, can i yes. add one one small yeah. thing um whenever Please. anyone asks me what they can do about it i always say lock your car and don't leave your loaded weapons in your car because We've had a number of, that's where the, the kids know, that's where people leave their guns. And we've had weapons stolen from cars, which have then later been used to commit crimes. So one easy, you would think it would be easy, but it's unbelievable how many people still just leave their guns and purses and laptops and valuables in their car. But the guns are just, the kids know that's where they can find guns or they're laying around the house, people's houses. And so, a gun safety um, approach is a tiny, tiny thing to do, but at least it's 
it's something. And, and especially these days when kids don't have anything to do, then unlocked cars are even more attractive, you know? So, so I, was, it, yes. I was just gonna second what, what Mayor Marlin was saying there. Okay. That it, it amazes me how many uh, burglary, motor vehicle burglary reports we take where somebody has left a loaded weapon or even unloaded, but left a, a useful weapon inside a vehicle that nobody really had to break a window to get to. They just open a door and, and take a gun out of there. And that's it, it's, it's amazing to me that as one who owns my own guns, I would never think of leaving that expensive and deadly piece of equipment just accessible to anybody. I mean, that is just irresp that is just the height of irresponsibility. Yes. Yeah. I know that we've tried through coalition meetings to convey that message regularly about locking uh, your guns in your doors and all of those things, uh, but it continues to be an ongoing issue. So let me address the issue of youth messaging because that's come up a couple of times on the comments. And so we've been working through the coalition to help identify youth to do messaging, specific messaging to youth through uh, traditional and non-traditional uh, means. And so if you as an organization or as an entity has been identifying youth for messaging, I uh, would love to have those through the coalition so that we can continue trying to get peer-to-peer -peer messaging to youth. Uh, we do have developed uh, a couple of messages that are more COVID related, but obviously our ability to, to message young people directly to each other is a really important part of this that we want to do more of. So again, we're, we're looking for messaging uh, for youth, by youth. Uh, and so I've been learning about TikTok. Didn't know anything about it until a couple of weeks ago. And so we're looking to do some messaging to youth through TikTok. We're looking through Instagram, Facebook, our public access TV channels, um, PSAs. So all of the full gamut, we're, we're working on pulling those together. And we've identified, uh, probably not surprisingly, a number of young ladies for messaging. So we are looking for some young guys, uh, guys that are more street-based to come help us convey messaging. And so whether they put it together on their phones or whether they, we use uh, the city resources, whether it's uh, all the means possible, we want to do more youth messaging right away. So we are looking for those and wanting to get that out on all forms of media, youth uh, conveying messaging to each other. And so I did want to get that out as there's been a couple of messages um, as it relates to um, uh, social media and its impact and its role that is playing with young people today. So I wanted to get that out to the group. Um, obviously, we have not talked about parents. And so, um, Jennifer, I don't know if you want to take that on and kind of just open it up as it relates to communication to parents and the importance of that and how we need to take that on as well as an issue. So one thing I was going to say earlier uh, when we were talking about um, the student, you know, that interruption, um, I really need that interruption to happen from the home. You know, I know in the fall when we had a couple shootings and we were um, checking in with kids on a daily basis, I, we were checking in with their parents and we, you know, we tried to have some real um, heart to heart conversations with parents about, you know, we know, we know your son has a gun. Where are they getting it from? And, and just trying to um, get to the root of that. Um, and, and some of it's generational. I mean, I think um, I strongly believe a couple of our parents knew that their young men were walking around with guns and, and, um, you know, condoned it as a as a, a a way for them to protect themselves. So I think that is a huge um, piece of of what we're trying to do is is to say, you know, we know this is happening. You know, it's happening. 
uh, work with us to kind of break that that cycle. So I know that that's not what you just asked me, but I know we were talking about that earlier and I was going to jump in. But, um, you know, I really need, uh, you know, a way that we can um, get to some of our families to, to, to help them understand why uh, it's not OK for their 15 year old um, to have access to a weapon and knowingly uh, walk around the neighborhood with it and, you know, and have it with their friends and, you know, be on Snapchat posting videos with it and, you know, uh, you know, doing all these things that we know they do. Um, and then when we want to have that conversation, you know, we, we, we don't feel like we always get um, that support. And again, I know, you know, I know our youth have to protect themselves and we, and we know that, there's a lot of retaliation um, and, you know, that just played out last week, right? It, that, that whole incident was, uh, you know, built up retaliation over a long period of time. So I think that is part of um, our going, ongoing challenge is to get, the, to get um, families and, and some parents to really um, help us to help, help, help the boys uh, and, and, and the girls of, um, the, you know, we know that we had some young ladies who were um, helping out uh, with um, the whole, you know, hiding the guns and, and things like that. And, and so, you know, we took a different route and tried to go through the young ladies and say, hey, we know this is happening, um, you know, to kind of help us. So again, it's just, you know, that whole um, breaking through that, you know, we can't tell, um, we, you know, we, we're not snitches, um, you know, we, we, we don't want to uh, be, be letting people know about what's going on behind closed doors. So I think that's just an ongoing piece that we, we continue to battle with in schools. Um, you know, well, that's, you know, that's one of the reasons um, that I want us really thinking about this from a collective Mm -hmm. And so as we empower and connect with our community-based organizations, again, maybe we're talking about the peer-to-peer -peer approach. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're saying uh, first followers or organization X. I know we've got the Youth and Family Peer, Peer Support Alliance. It's a family-based organization. Maybe we bring them in to go have those conversations with mm -hmm. those families. And we do that in a team approach, not a... Uh, team that's coming to come at you and down on you, but really, how's the best way of reaching this family? How's the best way of reaching this particular kid and his or her family? Um, because that's, that's the out of the box thinking that we have to make as part of this. Um, I'm pretty clear on certain kinds of kids I connect with and certain other kinds I don't, right? And so that doesn't mean that uh, we have to, give up on trying to reach that kid and that family. And so the other part of this that I want us to really be open about and understand is these numbers are not huge. So two years ago when we first sat down to do this, it was about 50 boys in Champaign schools between Central and Centennial, and it was about 20 boys in Urbana schools. And so those numbers are not that significant that we can't wrap each one of those those boys and their families to help address their needs and all of that. So I know there's been a number of comments around as a community, we've got to invest in these marginalized communities. We've got to look at what we're doing to invest in the need, the infrastructure, jobs, access to jobs, access to resources, uh, so that these kids and families aren't always fighting from behind. And that's something we have to take on as a community and not be afraid to say is that we've got to invest in these kids and their families. As Joel said, we can't arrest our way out of it. It's not gonna be a singular focus. It really is going to be looking at how do we as a community provide the direct supports and resources into the hands of these kids and families um, if we want change. I know I get the community brothers I always say to me, okay, Tracy, you want them to put the guns down? You want them to do something else? What is there for them, right? What is there for them? So uh, I want us all thinking again out of the box about how do we collaborate? How do we connect? Where's the best places to put these resources in? 
so that again, we get the best approach and the best outcomes uh, for these kids and their families. Uh, we all need those wins and they, they do as well. So we have a, a, about 10 minutes left and um, I wanted to bring Dawn in from Crime Stoppers. Through the coalition, we've invested in Crime Stoppers to strengthen programming. Again, we don't want uh, neighborhoods and communities to normalize our gun violence and think that um, this is okay and just the way that it's supposed to be. And so um, Crime Stoppers has partnered, come in and partnered with us through the coalition to help address our gun violence. And so Don, uh, you've got a couple minutes here to talk about Crime Stoppers. Thank you, Tracy. Um, we Crime Stoppers is a group of, of citizens that have come together and we exist to support law enforcement and to also provide a safe and anonymous way to give us information on crimes. And um, we want everyone to know that we are truly anonymous. We spend money on tech in order to ensure that if you are sending us in any information, it is completely anonymous. You are only identified by a code number throughout the entire process. And um, it's okay to tell us. As Jennifer was mentioning, you know, they don't, they don't want to say something about it um, because they don't want to be seen as a snitch. Well, we don't know who is telling us this information. So please give it to us and do the right thing and, and get the information in. Um, we have three ways of getting information, of you to get information to us. We have a phone number, 373-TIPS, uh, um, that's 373-8477. You can call, again, anonymous. Um, we don't have caller ID. You're not identified in any way. Um, and then we also have an app. It's called P3 Tips, and it's a free download on iPhone or the um, Apple Store or the um, Google Play Store. So that is easily um, put into the hands of the youth. We, you know, obviously they're on their phones all the time. That's an easy way for them to get information to us. Um, also, they, um, you can go on the website. It's 373tips.com. And again, give a tip there. Um, all anonymous ways. And another thing that we can do is we can also um, accept videos or photos through those ways. Again, the metadata on those videos and photos is completely stripped off and um, it comes to us completely anonymous. We, we don't want your name, we just want your information. That's all we want. Um, and so, you know, any small piece, you could be a neighbor and have a video camera um, and something occurred down the street and maybe you caught something on there and you still don't want to be the person that is um, giving that um, that information without being anonymous and you can, you know, you can easily do that as well. Um, we do pay cash rewards up to a thousand dollars on any um, information that you give. And back in uh, January of 2019, we also established the illegal gun bounty reward program. And what that is is if you give us information that leads to an arrest of someone who has used a gun in the commission of a felony crime you um, are automatically eligible for the max reward of a thousand dollars and over the last year and a half we have um, paid we have approved 17 of those paid so we've uh, paid out seventeen thousand dollars in rewards uh, cash again completely anonymous um, and we've taken 28 guns off of the streets um, and many of those were stolen or defaced guns as well. And what we're, um, obviously we wanna get that information out. That's why we participate in these uh, forums as well. And then um, we, we want to help getting, we want to help in getting that information to the youth. That's one of the things that um, we've struggled with is, is getting that information out. And so whoever might have some ideas around that, we are open to hearing those as well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so Mayor Catherine, I want you to share with our audience how they can connect with you. And, and we're capturing again, all of the comments. Uh, we wanna be able to respond, we wanna be able to share next steps. Uh, the, the, uh, 
Community Violence Response Task Force is a volunteer entity. Karen Sims is our point person for our community group. We are open and want community involvement. It's a place for us to connect. It's a place for us to link. Um, it's a, again, all volunteer group. And uh, we would love to get all of you interested in working and providing the solutions. I'm looking at the comments and I love them, right? So where, where can we find those additional community spaces to help work with these kids and family? Where can we put those constructive uh, uh, responses in place? And yes, community, it's gonna take resources. Yes, it's gonna take money uh, to solve this. And so all of us are dealing with the devastation of COVID-19 uh, as it is chewing up resources or we're not gaining resources because we're home. And so we, we're, we're not gonna be allowed to use it as an excuse uh, of not investing in our kids and in our community. And so just gotta get that out on record. But Mary Catherine, if you can just share contact information um, and it is a place for you to connect and, and, and get on board and involved. Absolutely. So I did share my email both in the Facebook and as, as well as the Zoom. Um, if you would like, if you have any youth that would be interested in helping craft and deliver messaging, um, we have some projects going on with youth already and we are always open to um, inviting more youth to the table to help craft that message. In response, uh, there was a question about why there, there weren't youth on the panel. Um, I would just like to say that some of the youth who are involved would do not want to, you know, it's not comfortable to be on a public panel talking about where uh, people who are their age get guns from. So we are mindful that there were no youth on this panel, but we, we are considering their conversations, uh, their, their contributions very seriously. And we are asking that if you can make those connections for us, um, please reach out to me with those. I also see Tracy Days from Dream um, has put some information about ways to connect with youth who, you know, who may be um, involved in some of the shooting. So you can reach me through email and, you know, the coalition through email, also our Facebook page. Um, we are there at Walk as One um, and we are available and, and we're ready to take input and we agree that we need this community to come together. And I think that this panel of partners uh, really represents the, and demonstrates um, our commitment to do just that. So thanks everybody for being involved and feel free to reach out. So panelists, uh, you have a 30 second uh, close out. Uh, and so, Mayor, I don't know if there's any final words you want to have before we close out today. Well, I would. Yeah. I always have one final word. Uh, I I would appreciate input on as we um, as we're re recrafting our as I mentioned the position description for our community outreach coordinator. If there if there are um, things that you think we should emphasize or special skills or background or knowledge, um, let me know. And, and this is a very, this is an important position and I want to get it right. So when are, when are you uh, posting it? When is it you hoping to have it filled by? Well, I would like it filled um, as soon as we can, but we're, we're just now rewriting it. So it'll be a while, you know, the hiring processes take a while in the city, but Okay. but we're in the process it's an opportunity to um update the position description so that's what we're doing well i do i do want to put it back on you a little bit preston was playing a, a pretty key role for a lot of us i know it was our community connection so i'd like you to think about who that's going to be in the interim until we get that position filled please okay so you want to put that out mayor fine and I, I saw that you uh chimed in wanted to give you 30 your 30 seconds to is there anything you wanted to add I just want to thank everyone for participating and Tracy for running the meeting. Obviously, these issues continue to be important. Um, and, you know, despite what is going on in the world, we have to continue to focus our attention on the youth in our community and find ways to engage. So thank you for continuing to do that. Yeah, thank you as well. Uh, Dr. Ivory Tatum. Well, I guess in closing, I love, um, you know, we've been talking about constructive, what, what are some constructive activities that we can, um, you know, come up with for uh, our youth right now, uh, considering we cannot have them in gatherings and at schools and, 
and things like that. Um, you know, what are those one-on-one, -on -one, having uh, 14, 15 year olds sitting in Zoom meetings um, or, you know, phone calls or, you know, they're, that's not the way to engage them right now is, is through the, the platform that we're in right now. So what are some of those other ways that we can, um, you know, we can't go, I, I mentioned this earlier, we can't go sit in their living rooms and, you know, and have, have uh, chats like we, we normally would. So, you know, I know the Boys and Girls Club is on, I think I saw Sam Banks and some others. So, you know, and Tracy, um, so, you know, what are those spaces where one, you know, we, as you said, we, we can get those releases from families, I mean, we want to have a space to be able to have those one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations. So what might that look like um, since it can't happen in the schools right now? Yeah, and I know that Champaign Schools is on the line as well as Ready. And so I, I really do want you all thinking about who are these uh, intentional group of boys that we need to be connecting with and, and who are really high flyers that we, we need to uh, poor and invest in. And so, girls, I don't, I, before, I'm sorry, Tracy, yeah. I, I oh, don't yeah. forget the girls. I mean, you know, because the incident last week, they were riding in a, one of the girlfriend's cars. Yeah. You know? So I think it's important that we make sure that we, we keep our young ladies um, a, as part of the conversation too, so. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Yeah, very important. Uh, Joel Sanders? Sure. I, one of the thoughts that popped in my head as, as we're having this conversation is one of the things we've done with, with the homeless population and, and mental health here in Champaign County is built relationships so that the peer-to-peer, the -peer, which is essential in, in getting help to, to that population, is at 3 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, if one of my officers comes across somebody, we've got resources we can call out immediately or, or people we can talk to immediately. And I don't know how this translates into the youth violence, but listening to, uh, to James talk makes me realize that we need to be able to have a, a much, more, um, much more communication between law enforcement and the individuals in our community who lived the life and got out and became successful. And how do we connect the, the, those individuals with these youth? Uh, in a more timely and, and um, fashion. And that's another conversation much longer than what we have on here. But I think with first followers and law enforcement needs to sit down and, and figure out how to more uh, effectively make those connections on, on a much quicker basis. Yeah. Tiger? Yeah, um, I would just like to turn everybody attention to uh, UIC study with best practices and some of the best practices as far as outreach they got is uh, knowing the signs that's number one so that's social media and watching these young guys and other things um, uh, what's that a feel safe environment changing the message that's that's important and most and, and I think the it's five of them but the last one I want to really end with is a uh, a source of mastery, a sense of mastery. And that deals with life skills. These young men have to tie up with somebody who can help them with life skills and build on their strengths instead of focus, focusing on their weaknesses. Instead of saying what you can't do, we start giving them opportunities what they can do. There are opportunities. When I was here working earlier, uh, back when the rap house was involved, you had events, you know, that they could go to. Right now, we we in a lockdown state, but these social activities are very important where they can uh, get out there and do their, you know, get a chance to express themselves. And I think a lot of them, we could connect with a lot of them because I, I work with both sides of these guys. You know, the little guy who got shot, paralyzed, I work with him and the ones who, you know, so I know they got a lot in common. They just don't see it yet, but they, there is a lot in common. And that right there is where we could kind of bend, you know, bend all that. And that peer-to-peer -peer group, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you guys with that. We need more programs with that. And uh, Go Mad is what we focusing on that through Go Mad, where we, where we teaching them life skills, uh, going in there, how to, how to build houses, how to do things with your hands, 
helping them with math skills, getting them back in school. They just got to be shown, you know, they just, they, it wasn't that they was not shown, it's just they didn't connect. So now we got to connect. That's it. Thank you. Let me thank uh, all of our panelists for your time and your leadership. Let me thank all 100 of you that took time to get on the call today. This is, this is powerful and this is what we must do as a community is, is come together to address this uh, crisis in the middle of a number of multiple crises that we are in right now. I think all of you know, if you have all, whatever opinions you have about the coalition, we've been action oriented. So we don't meet to just meet, to just talk. We've been very involved. We've been investing in our community. And, and so we're really seeing this um, as a catalyst to address this issue in the short term. So when we come out of our uh, stay at home state, uh, we've got a plan of action. And so that's really the catalyst for today is to start the process for our plan of action for the summer of 2020. And um, we're gonna get this done. We're gonna get this addressed and get this solved. I wanna thank all the folks that are on Facebook. I, I know we've got a hundred on our, our Zoom call. I don't know how many more are watching on Facebook. Hopefully you captured Mary Catherine's uh, touch base information. If we don't have you um, connected to us, uh, we wanna do that. Thank you community. Um, we have the best community downstate Illinois because of our ability to come together to address our community's most difficult issues. And we will address this one together as well. So thank you for attending the uh, Community Violence Response Task Force meeting today. Uh, we will be back in touch uh, immediately. Uh, as I said, this is not just a meeting to meet. And so, um, Thank you everyone for your attendance. Thanks City of Urbana for taking the lead for today's uh, meeting. And uh, again, thank you everyone.